This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Ledger, now accepting pre-orders for the all-new Ledger Blue Developer Edition, a Bluetooth and NFC touchscreen hardware signing device. Learn more about the Ledger Blue at ledgerwallet.com and use the discount code EPICENTER to get 10% off your first order. And by Hi.me. Protect yourself against hackers and safeguard your identity online with a first-class VPN. Go to Hi.me slash EPICENTER and sign up for a free account today. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with Matan Field. He's the CEO of Backfeed. Now, some of you may have heard of Backfeed. It's basically, it's an interesting company sort of exploring the concept of decentralized autonomous organizations. So we look forward to diving into that. It's a topic that we haven't explored for quite a while. So thanks so much for coming on, Matan. Yeah, nice to be here. Yeah, so Martin, we actually, we all, we, we did sort of meet. So when we were in, uh, with Eris, we were in Tel Aviv in, was it October? And we had a dinner and, and, and Martin came as well. So we, we but, but we didn't get to talk back then. So I'm, I'm glad we will have to, a chance to talk now. Um, can you tell us a bit, how did you get involved in cryptocurrency decentralization and uh, this whole field? Right. So, um, almost coincidentally, I would say, I I was doing uh, completely different things. I was uh, uh, doing my research, my postdoctoral research in uh, theoretical physics uh, at, a tech, at the Technion in the northern of Israel. Um, and during that time, I had an idea to build a real-time ride-sharing application. I uh, uh, joined with couple of my friends and we've uh, started working on this application and, and, and trying to solve the critical mass problem of how bringing enough early adapters to make real-time ride training work uh, at the first place. And through that process, that thinking process, we realized that um, we realized the ideas of, of tokens and, and decentralized organization, it was before, before those ideas. Um, were, were called like that and through that we basically came into the the Bitcoin and the blockchain space during that process eventually eventually we we I mean eventually real-time ride sharing became secondary and decentralization became primary and that's how I reached all this uh, field and and dived in at some point I just realized how how promising and and larger potential there is in it and, uh, and at some point I just quitted my uh, my academical research and uh, decided to focus on that. So you, you started working on, on ride sharing and that was before before you were aware of cryptocurrencies and blockchains and then you thought like, oh, that's that's a great fit and let me explore that. Right, yeah, so exactly. So I mean, as I said, I mean, the, the, in the real-time ride sharing uh, field, which was ne- which 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 hasn't been cracked down uh, yet. Um, there is a serious problem of how to uh, bring the early adapters because if there there are not enough early adapters, the right chain doesn't work. But if it doesn't work, how do you bring the early adapters? And our solution to that we said, well, we just you know we how many how many people do we need to recruit? Let's say in Tel Aviv we need one hundred thousand people, so let let's just make a project with one hundred thousand partners, and we just solved the critical mass problem. And then we ask the question, okay, but how a project with 100,000 people, you know, is functioning, how decisions are being made, how value is being distributed, and so on and so forth. And then we said, yeah, of course, you need to have some, some tracking of, of value, the tracking of, of, of economy. And then we said, probably, probably Bitcoin can do has some help on that front. And we dived into blockchain. That was exactly the same time where Ethereum where Vitalik has has it, had an idea has his idea of Ethereum, and and the whole revolution of decentralized organization has started. So it was a perfect match, and then we dived uh, deeply into the blockchain uh, scene, uh, and then we become we became from a ride sharing application we became we became a ride sharing decentralized application, um, and the more I worked on this, I realized that actually the the basic concept of decentralized organization. And the thing that we're still missing at the time of decentralized value distribution and so on 
are more basic and more generic and more big than specifically uh, ride sharing. And at some point, also start, I also decided to quit Lazuz, the, the decentralized uh, ride sharing application, and found Backfeed uh, early this early 2015 uh, to systematically build the, the the layers that were still missing in that space to to enable decentralized organizations. Yeah, so so there were some some parts and some components that you felt like were were missing for something like let's use to to really work. So we said like okay, let's let's try to build those base layer technologies and infrastructure layers so that applications like Lazus and you know a hundred others that will come that use a similar architecture can thrive in the future. Is that sort of the evolution you took? Yeah, exactly. So so basically. Um, I mean, in the you can you can think of Bitcoin as a as a, as a prototype for this future, and the, the idea is that millions of people can can collaborate or cooperate in decentralized uh, fashion by distributing distributing value that is being created. So in the Bitcoin case, it is by miners that verify transactions of others, and then for contributing to the network by verifying those transactions, they receive some of the value of the network in terms of new Bitcoin that are being issued. But then uh, that, that, is, that, is, that, that value distribution is only um, uh, enabled by algorithmically verifiable actions. In, the, that can, in that case, it's mining. Verifying transaction is algorithmically verifiable. But there was no way to, uh, to make a decentralized cooperation of a generic kind. So, for example, decentralized uh, coding uh, decentralized uh, startups, decentralized insurance, decentralized publish, publishing, decentralized journalism, decentralized uh, uh, lending, or whatever. But decentralized cooperation that requires actions that need to be valued or evaluated by, by, by real people and not by algorithms. So all this logical layer of decentralized governance, decentralized value distribution, decentralized influence, reputation system, uh, it was completely missing, and without which you cannot you cannot make a generic uh, decentralized cooperation. So we we came came up to build exactly the, the, to build and fill up that layer, and of course to de develop the whole uh, roadmap uh, further. So when you when you go to the Backfeed website, it, it it says it's a social operating system for decentralized organizations. And when you think of an operating system, you, know, you think of a a usually a computer or a mobile phone that has the central software that allows for software to be run and uh, for uh, sort of the ability for applications to talk to each other and you know interact with each other through a file system, etc. So um, can you give us the, the, the sort of broad overview of, uh, of Batfeed and how it, how it relates to uh, operating systems uh, as software. I mean, how, how, what is a social operating system is what I'm getting at. Right, right, right. So, so I mean, a computer is basically uh, the skeleton on top of which you can run softwares, just as the blockchain together with DHTs, distributed hash tables, are the, the skeleton to run decentralized applications. Um, but then you still, you still need, you're still missing the human uh, layer or before the human layer, you need still st still missing the the operating system for the human layer in order, just as I described before, in order to fac facilitate the central cooperation between human beings, uh, and this is the social operating system. Um, so 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 in that, that, that in that sense, it's uh, it's analogous. It's 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 the if, if you if you want, it's the it's the partly software, partly human layer that is enabling. Uh, to run social applications, to run collaborative efforts uh, of people. And what does that look like exactly? What are the the components of this technology, and how do people interact with it? So yeah, so it, it is not it is not a an application. It is it's a really more like an operating system on top of which you can build applications. Um, also, by the way, I, I should have also said that it's also the the system that allows to different for different software to be in, interoperable to, for, with each other, so different central co cooperation will be completely interoperable with each other, uh, and eventually will create one big network, one big collaborative network 
um, how it looks like. So different applications will may, may, may look uh, in different ways, but they, the basic idea is that the, the core protocol uh, within is uh, enabling people to feedback uh, each other's activities, to feed, feedback each other's contributions. Um, and then this feedback is kind of uh, tricky, and that's why it's backfeed, because when you feedback someone else, the, the environment feedbacks you. So the more you are aligned with the network, the more your feedback uh, brings your reputation upward and also counts more. So, and if you are disaligned in your feedback with the network around you, then your reputation decreases. That's what we call it backfeed. Um, so basically, it's a protocol that collects, if you want, all of the feedbacks in a network, and by that creates the influence power, the reputation, creates the value distribution, and also creates alignment, um, multi-value system alignment. So, so if you have initially a, a, you know, a, a big network with, let's say, millions of people that all think very differently, then by, via this protocol, organically and spontaneously, the network starts to um, crystallize around different value systems. And all of which are uh, legitimate. legitimate. Just, just, as, just as GitHub basically allows an, an organic uh, creation of different opinion of, on, of how code should be, uh, should be designed, and you have multiple branches of code. So in this case, you will be, have multiple branches of value system, of reputation system. I, I, up until now, had not even realized the word play with feedback and, and back feed. <laughs> um, but uh, you mentioned in a talk, I was watching one of your talks that you did at, at DEFCON recently, and, and you said that identity is defined by your actions. You are what you do. Um, and that's an interesting idea because in um, in traditional identity systems, your identity is defined by you know a whole lot of other things. And we've had uh, we've had guests talk about identity on on the podcast a, a bunch of times before. Identity can be defined by you know uh, what other people say of you. Identity is also defined by what you say about yourself. Uh, identity can also be defined by um, a power structure like the state. Uh, but it's the first time that I ever hear someone say that identity is defined by actions. Uh, give us, uh, you know, tell us what this looks like and how it applies to reputation, uh, your reputation score in Backfeed. Right. So um, in a decentralized world, you can, you can participate from, you know, from your node on the network and do whatever you do. You can, you can uh, contribute code, you can contribute ideas, you can write blog posts, you can, you can make comments. Uh, or or, any, or anything else. This will also connect with the Internet of Things and 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 basically our physical world. Um, and for your actions, uh, your actions have influence, right? They have consequences in the world, and the network around you can feedback or backfeed um, on on those activities. So so basically, people can appreciate or di or disappreciate your contribution. Um, and and if, at the end of the day, I mean, I can I can also handle several identities. It's completely legitimate. But these several identities will basically have only part. Each of them will have part of my history. And, and at the same time, we can, we the three of us, can also handle one identity, which is completely legitimate. This identity will have history of activities. It will have opinions, and according to the activities that it will do, and then the feedbacks that the network will uh, uh, make on them, this identity will have. A level of reputation. Now it's not one reputation because you have uh, many many different networks uh, and each network has its own reputation system. Even a part of a network is, can be another network which has its own reputation system. And then a, a, an identity will be the aggregation of all of its actions and the aggregation of all of the feedbacks on these actions and the resulting uh, multiplicity of reputations in all networks. So I'd love to go a little bit deeper here and explore how this can work. So, so you mentioned that uh, it, you could have a sort of branching off and you have a different network that coalesce around different value systems. Um, how would that work in reality? Can you give an example of that? So, so for example, let's, let's discuss uh, uh, um, maybe we can... Let's discuss several examples, but let's start with one and then we can discuss later in more depth uh, example, another example that we work on. So, for example, 
Um, there is a very simple application that we started to build uh, about curation of content on the web. So, um, you know, you can, on, on, any, on any website that you are, you can, you, can, you can click if you want to curate that website, if you like that website, right? Because eventually, the problem is that the internet is just vast and huge, and we're not even touching the 1% of the internet, and Google decides for us what is the right, uh, it's, the, it's the tragedy of the, of the filter bubble. So Google decides for us what, what is right to see for us and what is not. Um, and imagine that all of the people in the, around the world can, you know, can, can inform each other about good network, good website versus bad website. And then if you, know, if you and, and I have similar, similar opinions and we curate the kind of the same content similarly, then gradually we are, we are we're starting to aggregate a network around us uh, which is with, with, sim uh, with like-minded people. And this network will start to curate content, you know, uh, uh, according to its opinions. But maybe some other some other person is, you know, thinking differently, and you know, some other people people and they uh, they curate content in a different way. Um, and eventually, what you'll have you'll have many networks that curate content differently. They see the website differently, and with this extension, you will be able to search the web. It's like a kind of search engine, but it's more more than engine. I would say it's a mind. It's a search mind you will be able to, to, to search the web for stuff according to the value system of other people. You can, you can ask yourself how, you know, how people in, in, uh, in Argentina uh, look at uh, things rather than people in China, or how left-wing people think in terms of the web with respect to right-wing right people and so on. So you'll be able to look at the web from different goggles of different networks uh, with different value systems. Or different, li or different likes and dislikes. Let's take a short break so we can go to Paris. I stopped into La Maison du Bitcoin, the house of Bitcoin, at the Ledger offices, and I met with Ledger CEO, Eric Larchevêque, so he could tell me all about the Ledger Wallet Chrome app. The Ledger Wallet Chrome app is a perfect companion app for your Ledger HW1 or Nano. We have very powerful and cool feature. You can use multi accounts, for instance, personal accounts, business accounts, this is very useful. Also, when you want to make a transaction, we use a second factor verification. You can either use a physical security key or cryptographically securely pair your Android or iOS smartphone to your Nano. This way, when you issue a transaction, a payment, the transaction will pop up on your Android or iOS phone and you will be able to verify the amount and destination address. Finally, the Ledger Chrome app has an API with which you can easily integrate third-party applications. For instance, if you want to create a multi-signature account with CoinKite or Copay, it will be done using the Ledger Wallet Chrome app. Ledger is making hardware wallets easy and convenient without compromising on security. If you want to get a secure setup for storing your Bitcoins, go to ledgerwallet.com and use the code EPICENTER to get 10% off your order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. You know, let, let's say if you look at an example of a decentralized system where you have obviously a uh, very uh, wide divergence of value, I think Bitcoin would be a great example, right? And it's not really clear to me here how you can have easily a sort of divergence into, you know, multiple Bitcoins that have, uh, you know, different views and you know different interpretations you know let's say around what is this thing actually supposed to do because you have network effects that are so big that it just it doesn't really work so do you do you think that's gonna do you know network effects would be one thing that prevent these sort of systems to emerge so no so uh, yeah i mean no and yes. I mean, for Bitcoin, it doesn't it doesn't fit uh, in this uh, in this th in, if you want in this scheme because it's not designed in that way from the beginning. But in the right with the right design, what I speak about is is basically a fractal of network. So it's not just just many many different networks which don't speak it with each other. There is a fractal structure of a network that is in a way divided to many subnetworks that divide too many subnetworks and so on and so forth and all these networks are not independent of each other they do have economical and reputational relationship between them so that eventually in in a way you are this kind of fractal of network is leveraging both competition and cooperation or if you want agreement and disagreement so 
in a way two networks are using co uh, a common component on whatever they agree about and use different component on whatever they disagree about. And in that way you, you, you both explore maximal cooperation and the same times the diversification of opinion and competition of, of, on the disagreements. So these different networks are not independent of each other. They, 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 they do build one big network of information. They do build one big network of cooperation. So there is, you don't lose the network effect. Okay, so it, it wouldn't work with something like a, a cryptocurrency in that case. It, you think it would work with a publishing system? Can you talk a little bit more, you know, let's say if you take a, a general, or, or can you give another example of, of how sure. that could work and how this sort of exchange of value and competition and collaboration would work? Yeah, sure. So let's let's take let's explore another let's explore decentralized uh, journalism or publishing, which is something that we work on today. So so for example, anyone can uh, add content to that network. Anyone can write a blog post. Anyone can ed suggest edit of others' blog post. Anyone can suggest new title, or anyone can um, you know suggest comments or translations to the network. Now. Communities who are like-minded or systematically like-minded will appreciate the same content and this kind of content will start to aggregate in that community. Now, different community may appreciate different content and this different content will start to aggregate around, around that community. But they may very uh, well have you know, com um, common component or common content that both communities appreciate. Now it's not that it's not that uh, it's not it's not like binary. So it's it's basically uh, a continuous evaluation of content, uh, which will vary between the two communities, and the the content that both communities will will highly appreciate will be visible in both communities, and content which is only appreciated by one of the communities will be more visible. Uh, will be visible only in that community, or or content that is more uh, highly evaluated in one community than the other will be more visible in one community rather than the other. But as a whole, those two communities will be part of one big community. They will, ha they will have access to one big database uh, of information. They will just choose to, to look, to view that database in a different, differently. So eventually, at the end of the day, you'll have one big decentralized journalism, but with two different goggles to look at it, to read two new newspapers, if you want, from the same database of content. So whatever whatever they agree about, they leverage and build up more content with the net with the net network power of the whole network. Whatever they disagree about, indeed, that's where they have. If you want less of the network that is building up that power, but that, but that's just because they disagree about it, that it makes sense. So in that way, you leverage. If you want, you build up the, the opti optimization between uh, cooperation and diversity. And how do you connect? So, in the in in the context of this example, just uh, uh, decentralized journalism, uh, let's let's hypothesize that you have, like you said, a fractal, uh, some sort of fractal pattern of of this network that stems from this initial uh, idea of having, say, a, a newspaper. Um, it it sort of starts to look a bit like evolution where some branches will become more powerful and other others will become um will have less influence can you can you talk about the dynamics there what happens when you start having you know perhaps thousands of branches on what was initially one newspaper uh the, what 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 impacts does that fragmentation of information have? How do you then know, you know, what would be sort of the correct information? Are we, are, can we assume that the you know, bigger branches are correct or, um, or is there something else at play here? Well, well, firstly, there is no correct or incorrect. There is just the branches that alive, get, stay alive and the branches that die out. And you gave the perfect analogy uh, for, to evolution. This is evolution, in fact. It's very, very analogous to evolution. In fact, you have the same two forces. So in evolution, you have a force of alignment. So the backfeed protocol works in a way that creates a feedback loop so that people who are systematically aligned with each other, their reputation is gradually increasing. And then at the next step, they define the axis of alignment 
in a stronger way, and then it's still it, it's still keep increasing. So you have a force that drives towards alignment, homogenization, which is the same force force of genes that drives into homogenization of species when in closed environment. Okay, could 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 you also use something like backfeed then to create a prediction market? Then? Because it seems like the mechanics would be somewhat similar, only you would have human reputation on the line. Yeah, it's 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 a little bit it's a little bit analogous to prediction market, but prediction market, but non-economical prediction market. It's a reputational prediction market market in a way, uh, and and this, you have also the second force that in evolution, uh, well, mutation basically uh, make the diversification uh, from homogeneity, and here the fact that you are misaligned with the community around you um, makes you the incentivization to fork out. To a new network, and this will create a dynamics that will balance itself organically and dynamically. So, if you have too much of diversity, you you'll be able to collect power from from you know from cooperating with people and and agreeing with them and building the network effect. If you have too strong a network, too too much hom homogeneous, then people will be able to create value from forking out and exploring new dimensions, new directions. So, in a way, organically, just like evolution. Society with this decentralized governance mechanism will explore, explore the whole spectrum, the whole uh, space, if you want, of the of directions, of actions, of opinions, and whatnot, in a way which which will be able to maximize and optimize uh, itself. So you know, if you have too much homogeneity, it will create diversity. If you have too much diversity, it will create homogeneity. Okay. Now you also mentioned in in one of your talks that. Uh, um, that reputation is seeded by making a valuable con uh, contribution perceived by as reputable agents. How, if, if you have say one branch of a system where there's enormous reputation, enormous weight of the community behind it, uh, how, how would it be possible then in that case for any one other agent to branch off uh, and be successful if network effects are so big there. And I'll also, I, I'm trying to get my head around this, but um, what would a sort of the, I guess the equivalent of a 51% attack look like in um, in a system such as proof of value? Right, right, I guess those right. are two questions that may not be directly related, but. Right, right, right. So, so the idea is that, yeah, the more the network, the more the network, the bigger the network, the more the network effect exists. Then, in a way, the harder it is to change the momentum of that network. But at the same time, the economical model that uh, 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 lies uh, beneath this uh, this protocol is, in a, is analogously to the Bitcoin, is giving more value to early adopters. More val the earlier you are in a in a network, the more value, the more financial ownership that you gain from that network. So in a way, if you can fork that network to a new direction that will, in the future, uh, uh, drive a lot of attention, then the earlier you are doing that, the more, uh, the more value you gain, so the, the bigger the incentive to do so. so that, and that's exactly what will balance that. So if the network is too big, if you want, and the homogeneity is not justified, meaning there are enough people who think differently, then there will be incentive for that person, you know, for that entrepreneur to fork out the network and find and found a new direction for others to follow and those early adapters that will follow will also gain from the network and then that builds that builds a snowball effect right so so the economical incentive for early adoption is basically balancing out the the, the rigidity of the of the momentum of a network effect that is gener being generated uh, that makes sense and in terms of 51%, then there, just like there, also here, you have a 51% attack. Like if you, if you can take over 51% of the reputation in the network, then you are definitely controlling the network. But the whole point is that the, the, uh, like if you, if you are 51% of the network, you are the network, right? You should do whatever you want. And if you, will, if you rule the network in a way that will not, make hap it will not make the other people happy, they will just fork out to get a new network. So in that way, you cannot really. You see, the, the forking out can always run away from you. You can, you cannot, like you cannot control anyone. Um, what, one big difference in that protocol. Uh, this is a more, bit more technical, but but there is a, there is an inherent uh, tension between um, scalability, uh, decentralization, and resilience. 
So decentralization requires that uh, information and decision is distributed along the whole network and not gathered in one place. Um, and resilience requires that in a way every decision needs to be approved by 51% of the network. But then that brings, brings an inherent tension with scalability because, you know, when, when the network is very big, it's, it's, not, it's, unimag it's unacceptable that every decision is being observed by 51% of the people on the network. And here we're talking about actual people observing an activity. It's not, it's not a machine observation, although also in the blockchain, mach machine observation is also a bottleneck for scalability. But in human network, it's much more severe, right? And so this is a built-in tension. And, and the solution, the resolution of that paradox is exactly this fractalization. So fractalization, or if you want compositionality, let you have, uh, a, a, let you make decisions with less attention in the network. Like the, the example, well, you can think of the uh, US uh, political um, uh, architecture. This is the same thing, but, but uh, just for, for, for a simple example, if you have nine people with equal weight on the network, uh, you need five of them to agree about any, any decision. But if this nine is, is, is separated, is divided into three groups, and each group is divided to three people, again, all of, our, all of whom are uh, equal weighted, then you can see that you can get a majority vote by four people, two of each of the two networks. So you, can, you see you can get a vote to, to pass, uh, or a decision to pass with less attention in the network, and, and you can show that the more you fractalize network, the less the, 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 the threshold for decision uh, is going down. So in a way, the 51% is going down, down, down. But you can show that it, it, it happens in a way that doesn't disrupt resilience. Because although you need less and less people to control, well, to take decision, you need more and more specific configurations of people to do so. And you can show in, in a simulation that in, it, it is done so organically in a way that resilience is kept in, uh, intact. All right. That's, um, it's, it's quite a challenge to wrap your head around that, I have to say. Now, I had a question before that maybe it ties into that. So it, with something like a prediction market, I mean, I have been thinking about that, especially also in the context of Augur, where, you know, you have like different people predicting things and, you know, you want to predict like what everybody else is predicting, right? So in proof of value, because, you know, outliers basically get punished and uh, you, you're deemed to be bad at, you know, predicting things or evaluating things if you diverge too much from the sort of consensus. So you have a similar system. Um, do you think that's a, you know, that leads to, for example, good decisions and good, or does that just lead to sort of, you know, least common denominator and, you know, you sort of try to, you know, have this homogenization and everybody fitting in with each other? Well, yeah, I, I think, I think, it, I think it, it, it works good, but let, let me, let me emphasize two things. Firstly, um, um, you're not being punished. Your reputation is decreasing in a network if you are systematically misaligned with it. But that's completely good. Like I don't want to have a hyper reputation in a network that I don't think that I'm not like-minded. Like I don't want to have my feed, uh, you know, spammed by a network that thinks differently. Actually, I, w I want to have a lower reputation in a system where I'm misaligned. But then I have the incentive to just open a new network which is aligned with my opinion. So actually, I want. You have the ins you have the incentive to just express. It's not a prediction mark in that sense. It's analogous, but it's not a prediction mark. I don't have an incentive to predict the future. I actually have the incentive to say what I think uh, should happen, and then the network will organize around my opinion, or not organize around my opinion. Then I will have the incentive to fork to a new network, or or I will just be driven to a network that uh, is more like-minded. That's one thing. The second thing is that the protocol is not only not only about uh, alignment and this my this alignment is also about in a way innovation. So the early earlier I kind of express different opinion from the majority, and then people some people follow my route, then I will gain more reputation around that because I was early. So in a way I have the incentive. I actually have the incentive to say what I think should happen, not 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 what I believe will happen by network, but I, what I think should happen, and I should I have the incentive to say that as early as possible. Yeah, so that makes sense to me. I think that early, early mover reward, I think that that could have some effect, not necessarily to say what you think, but, you know, if, if you think you see 
uh, an opinion that may be unpopular today, but you think will yeah. become popular in the future, you know, then sort of, you know, standing up for that might be, uh, might be a good move. Uh, I mean, but when you say, you know, you just start another network, I guess a lot of this depends here on, you know, what are we talking about? What are the costs of setting up another network? You know, is that just a sort of automatically it happens or it, it it's really hard i think to wrap your head around that because we talk about it so abstractly right i i you know when I, if i try to sort of translate it to bitcoin for example then you have like yes you can do that you know you can like fork the code base do a new coin but the costs are enormous i mean maybe the cost of of just doing the copying is not enormous, but the cost of like actually trying to create value there, moving people over is enormous. So I, I wonder if you'll have similar effects here or, or if, if maybe what you mean when you talk about networks is something quite different. Well, uh, yeah, in some, in some it depends on, so firstly, it depends on application. In some application, forking out to a new network is just completely automatic, it just happens. Uh, it, so these two different networks are not really separable from each other. They are actually still using the same code base and same everything. Just the reputational system is forking out, or also the economical system. Um, but then in some network it might be manually. So just with a click of a button, new new reputation system will be created around me. Um, and in and and yes, I mean maybe thousands of them will be created all the time and will just die out because not enough people are interested in that dimension will be alone. But then those who, just like evolution, those who, who will have resonance around them will start growing and they will have more and more incentive to grow them further. And then they, they, will, they, they will still use the same code base and same information and same everything. They are not separable from each other, the two networks that just forked, but they just use different reputation system. And in fact, even that is not like completely distinguishable. Like it's not that I, I will only use that system or only use that system. I will have reputation of that system and you have reputation of that system. And again, it will. It's just if you want, it's just it's just a machinery to to in a way identify alignment and misalignment and more alignment and so on between people and aggregate that and and in a way organically and spontaneously uh, mark where. Uh, like-minded people uh, 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 think together. So um, you mentioned reputation isn't money in this system, but there is something a little bit like money or tokens or a currency or, or an app coin or whatever it is called. How does that work and what, what's the role of that? Right, so, so the idea is that whenever people are doing activities in the system uh, and then they are feedbacking each other, then two things happen. So one thing is that there is a, there is a reputation distribution, um, or may, again, maybe the reputation is a little bit confusing, but, but, but the influence power in the system is being distribu re distributed and redistributed. But another thing is that the, the economical power in the system, the, if you want the economic, economical ownership in the system is being re redistributed all the time. So if I'm doing contribution, to, if I'm contributing to a network, then I get uh, back from the network some, some of the value in that network and that that value is is taking place in terms of crypto tokens and each system each network has its own crypto tokens now these crypto tokens are comp com com completely tangible you can you can you know you can exchange them you can trade them or you can just keep you keep them in your wallet and they are indeed decentralized application dap tokens and they are dap to tokens because once a network is becoming uh, powerful enough and it produces something Maybe this something is decentralized journalism. Maybe this something is decentralized ride sharing or whatnot. Then you will need, or not you, but anyone else will need to have those tokens, the same tokens that were, that were being distributed to early adapters and early contributors. You will need to use those tokens in order to facilitate the new service or product or value that was created by that network. So people that will have those tokens will be able to use them in order to facilitate the value. And people who will not who won't have the, those tokens will have to purchase them, and then either the people who don't have the token can purchase the tokens for people who have them, or you can also do that via the system, which although decentralized, hold a smart contract that runs uh, in a way like a bank, and then people who can who doesn't who don't have token can purchase those tokens from the network, and people who have tokens can sell their tokens to the network. And, and gain back the funds that are entering from the people who purchase tokens from the network. So in that way, uh, that, that creates a demand for those tokens that gives them a real tangible value 
and that basically re that basically uh, reward back the early contributors and, and early uh, adopters. This is this is basically just a generalization, although somewhat differently uh, put. It's a generalization of the Bitcoin economy. Right. So I mean, we, we've this is of course these are ideas that we have actually talked about many times on this show. So we've had. You know, Joel Dietz on once upon a time, quite a long time ago to talk about Swarm, you know, when they were doing their thing, which is very similar, right? We also had Gems on, which was a similar idea that you had an app where you would reward early contributors who, you know, made the app popular and then they got some reward for that. We've had Storage on at one point, also quite a while ago, which was a similar thing where, you know, you people would sort of contribute to network with their hardware thing and and of course even ethereum you could think is is in a way it's a little bit like that right Either you pre-sell the currency and then it was given to um to the developers as well right and then if, into a foundation the and that, yeah the miners right um so yeah, I, I think that that idea of, of crypto equity is, is certainly interesting. Although to be honest, I feel like the results have been a little bit underwhelming with a lot of these projects that, you know, there was a lot of sort of promises and a lot of uh, excitement and it didn't sort of quite live up to it. I, I, I guess that might have a lot to do with what we're talking about here, right? The sort of lack of tools and lack of technologies to actually enable those processes. Is is that one of the reasons that informs also how you go about it here? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think those ideas are great, but they they were just very premature. I think we were lacking systems. We were lacking the, even the blockchain technology was still premature. Uh, the DHT technology. Uh, needed for that is premature. The integration between them was premature. The protocol that I'm talking about, the economical protocol, were premature. The governmental pro protocol completely uh, misexisted, um, and uh, it was just a very early uh, and visionary, but but very far from implementation. And then that's exactly what we have decided to 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 to, fit, to, to do differently this time. We decided to firstly build up the foundation in a very systematic way. Uh, and only then start building application with those uh, with those uh, technology, and that's that's what where we are right now. We are we're having, I would say, not even the full uh, foundation in place, but we have we are having, we're having large chunk of the foundation now technology in place, and now we're starting to build proof of concepts, uh, but from A to Z. It will it will still take long time before the technology matures, but we hope to have. This year, a first example of a completely decentralized cooperation. Um, maybe it's not will not be fully scalable. Maybe it's not be fully generic. Maybe it not be uh, I don't know fully operational. But it will be it will be working and proving itself. Uh, and then I think this technology in the future will gradually build itself in the in the coming in the uh, coming five years or so. Let's take a short break and talk about Hide.me. You know, setting up a VPN on multiple devices can be complicated. Let's say you want to do like three devices and you have 10 different exit nodes that you want to configure. Well, that's 30 different configurations that you have to do manually in each of those devices OS, and that can take a long time. Hide.me makes this super easy with their apps. So they have apps for Windows, Mac OS, Android, iOS, and Windows Phone. So you just install the app, log in, and boom, you're ready to use VPN with Hide.me. So this is perfect if you're traveling, you just install the app on your devices, and say you're using public Wi-Fi, you turn on the app, you connect, and you're completely protected against hacking, man in the middle attacks, or any type of malicious activity. And of course, the apps work with their free plan. To try out their free plan, head to hide.me slash epicenter. It includes two gigabytes of data, which is more than enough to keep you protected when you go traveling. It also includes three exit nodes in Singapore, Amsterdam, and Montreal. And if you use our URL, so hide.me slash epicenter, it's gonna give you 35% off if you ever decide to sign up for a premium account. And their premium account includes unlimited data. It includes up to five devices connected simultaneously. So you can put your grandmother using a VPN, even your dog's tablet, you can put on a VPN. Uh, and you can use any of their exit nodes and they've got 30 exit nodes all over the world. And of course, you can pay with Bitcoin. So give it a try, and we would like to thank Hightop Me for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. 
So let's talk a bit more about applications. We've, we mentioned uh, the idea of decentralized journalism. Tell us what are some other, you know, perhaps like far into the future, or maybe not so much far into the future, applications that you're most excited about and that are in all fairness like most likely to work with something like this because i think there's certain types of things that definitely would be hard to build on on, a, on an application like this but others are as perhaps more obvious what are your thoughts on that right so yeah i think we're just try starting to scratch the the surface of it um so there are there are those applications that are coming from from the from the content I would say like journalism and publishing and book writing and there are applications who come from from the making like decentralized startups so what what it looks like meeting people who who build the startup together um, and, and there will there will be applications that are more financial in nature like uh, social trading of assets like decentralized insurance like decentralized lending. Um, there are, you know, uh, real like real life application, more like uh, real time ride sharing and other ride sharing application tra or transportation application. Um, there will be more, more, more like the so from the social, like social networks, uh, Twitter, uh, etc. There, are, there will be a lot of applications that 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 use the if you want the curation, the evaluation component, in a way like decentralized Yelp or decentralized product hunt. Or, or those kind of, of network uh, that, that, that basically help people to reach out to the content, to the, piece of, to the information that they are looking after. Um, what else? I'm sure there are many others that I, I just don't think of right now, but uh, there are basically tens and hundreds of, of, basically every industry that you can think of, I think, will have a decentralized uh, counterpart. Okay, and specifically with regards to to governance. So we we, we sort of brushed on this uh, before the show, where we said that this could potentially be useful for uh, for something like Bitcoin in the context of the, the block size debate and figuring out what uh, is the good decision to take. And 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 you mentioned, uh, I think that you there's a a Git uh, a GitHub plugin um, that uh, you're developing. So in, in terms of governments of governance of say things like a software project or governance of just, you know, government, like social of, government of anything. Uh, of anything, but you know, like state government also. Uh, t tell us about how you think that backfeed, what role you think backfeed could play there and how those dynamics would play out. Well, I think any decentralized interaction, cooperation, collaboration of many uh, will need some some level of governance, and that can be from, as you say, decentralized governance for 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 decentralized uh, application like just such such like Bitcoin, um, where today we are, we speak about decentralized uh, uh, application, but the governance, the building of the application is completely centralized, or we can talk about central decentralized collaboration to build stuff together. And I'm saying that in the future we will just have decentralized organization where the, the building of stuff and the, the usage of stuff and the adapting of stuff is not separable from each other. It's just one one continuous or one continuum. Um, and so so yeah, so decentralized governance is starting from you know from application to collaborations and eventually to meta collaborations, uh, you know, between different applications or between different networks, and eventually also I would say to 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 real you know to real life networks to IoT whether it's IOTs or actually, you know, municipalities or states. I, I see no, no reason why it will uh, not reach there, although, of course, it will take more time. But eventually, I think once, uh, once um, I would say, we learn how to spontaneously, indirectly manage a society, um, I think we will find out that this unmanagement, if you want, is, is a... Uh, order of magnitude more efficient than centralized coordination, and in that way, we'll we'll find out to be uh, more powerful, more resilient, more participatory, uh, more gr growing faster, uh, and probably also more fair uh, and 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 uh, and uh, desired for everyone. So yeah, I think I think eventually it will reach out to to real life governance as well, but it, of course it will take much more time for that. 
And uh, one, one issue that we wanted to touch on as well, and uh, we were supposed to have one of your co-founders on uh, Primavera de Filippi. She couldn't make it, unfortunately. Um, and we wanted to ask her the question of the legal status uh, of DAOs. Of course, she's done a lot of work on this and because um, it is part of her, uh, her research. Uh, and the idea of the, 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 the question of legal status of DAOs has come up quite a bit you know, when we were talking about We've been talking about DAOs, uh, simply like crowd sales, like Ethereum's crowd sale. It had, it had been questioned whether or not those were legal or not. And with something like the, the zoos, Brian and I were speaking about it earlier before the show. And uh, it, uh, well, the legality of something like the zoos uh, could be questioned where, you know, you're potentially building a taxi service that uh, is made up of people that don't have taxi licenses. So um, how does a, a DAO where, where there is no uh, central uh, authority managing it fall into an existing legal framework? Are the individuals taking part in something as disruptive as building a decentralized uh, ride sharing system? Are they not becoming, are they not putting themselves at risks uh, individually to be targeted by you know, lawmakers that would say something like, you know, you can't do this, we're going to fine you, and we're going to take your, your driver's license away, or perhaps take your car away. So, well, yeah, Lazo is very particular because of the because of the taxi and driving stuff and insurance. But but actually, there, since since we're speaking about real time ride sharing, and it's not commercial drive, then I think there is no there is no issue about an insurance uh, or, or risk. Um, still, the, the the sensitivity is not that definitely it's not actually there, the sensitivity is in the token economy, uh, and the, the the if you want the risk is the exposure of these tokens to definition of uh, securities or the the exposure of the uh, the the whole monitor system around it to 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 uh, definition of uh, banking and all that. These are these are the serious uh, 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 sensitivities. Um, there is a lot of work put forward to to struggle that because uh, in a way. Th those new futuristic uh, technologies and systems are right now bound bound to old uh, regulations which doesn't fit them anymore um, and 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 are not serving the purpose anymore and there's a lot of work to in a way to um, uh, legally architecture that that framework that will make that uh, that, that system uh, uh, legal uh, uh, and leg legitimate and at the same time, there's a lot of effort to change regulation uh, to fit uh, the future. Um, so I would say that, um, yeah, I would say that there are two, if you want, two ways or, yeah, three, three ways to think about it, two that I just mentioned. One is, one is building, the legal, building the legal architecture to make what, uh, what exists right now in the new technology fit the, the current uh, regulation. Another effort is to change uh, the current regulation. And a third, if you want, ideology is, is simply to build a truly decentralized network. And then regulation in a way is just, just impossible. I mean, even today, the regulator could have woke up and say, well, Bitcoin is illegal. But there is just simply no way to regulate any more Bitcoin and say it's not legal. It's just there. It's just impossible to, you know, to, to uh, unroot it. So in a way, it's too late for the regulation. The regulation has to face it, the existence of Bitcoin, and to adapt its regulation accordingly. So the same thing happens here. I think there are advances in all three fronts, and eventually, I think it will just uh, meet somewhere in the middle. We are personally trying to, uh, we are, we are planning to in the next in the coming year uh, to spend a lot of our resources on on building those legal architectures that will make those frameworks completely legal uh, in all jurisdictions. And and we're, we'll, I mean, it will take it will take a long time before the network will be fully decentralized at a technological level. So we are not waiting to that time. We're just trying to adapt what we are doing uh, to be legal in the current uh, regulation scheme. Today's magic word is feedback. F e e d b a c k. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener award.
so is Backfeed uh, sort of a regular startup, you know, that has raised money from investors and is trying to, you know, make money and exit at some point? Or do you guys have a, what is the business model here? Right. So Backfeed, yeah, Backfeed is a company that was one of the lessons I took from Lazuz. Lazuz, we, we said, no, we are building decentralized cooperation. We will be ourselves decentralized cooperation. But that was a little bit too naive because it was too early. The tools were not mature. The framework, the protocols, and nothing was mature enough. Uh, and this time we said we'll do it. We'll, we'll extrapolate. We'll start in the old world. We'll found a company. We'll raise money. We'll have a business model. And then gradually we'll build a new world. Eventually we'll decentralize ourselves as well. So... So yes, Backfeed is a company we've raised so far in two rounds, uh, about half million dollars. Uh, we're now raising actually these very days, we're raising a few, a, a little more fund. Um, we are also now actually in process of raising larger funds from VCs um, that we are hoping to close uh, in the near future. And we have a business model. So the business model is, is very simple, it's just the business model of decentralized cooperation is that if you are contributing to the network, you receive tokens. As I said, those tokens become valuable because they are needed to be uh, to be fa to facilitate the network. And and us backfeed as as if if one is a founding agent, we are, we, we will receive uh, amount of of tokens for our contribution to that network. So initially, will be the founding contribution. We'll will have all the tokens, but then the, the as long as the network is growing will just become just one more agent. You know, Backfeed the company will just become one agent in the network uh, that is contributing and getting tokens and eventually redeem those tokens into funds. Um, and if you want, like my, my vision or my dream is, is, is actually making an IPO, but IPO not in the stock market, but IPO into the decentralized world. So eventually Backfeed can dissolve in a decentralized organization that it has founded. So it will just disappear into it. Um, yes, and, we, and, and the idea is to create value for the investors that's you know that's that we need that to engine and and, and fuel uh, uh, our development so it serves it serves that future so we're not trying to we're trying to build a new future but we are still relying on the existing one yeah okay no that that certainly is uh, it's an interesting model right uh, i think i remember talking about this with vc actually at the at ages ago you know two years ago or something where we had that sort of conversations like oh would you would you be allowed to for example invest in tokens directly or you know maybe invest in a company that then does this sort of thing and comes out with with tokens um so, so you you alluded to a little bit that the sort of world you see and, and I think especially like backfeet dissolving into a into this kind of decentralized organization itself if we project forward and let's assume that, you know, this is successful and a lot of other projects like that are successful and, you know, this technology gets, you know, adopted on a wide scale, what kind of world, what's the world going to look like? And what are the sort of second order effects of that? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so firstly, first of all, um, you can be sure that the world will be decentralized. And by that, I mean that everything will be decentralized. Um, human beings and 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 inter in artificial intelligences, and well, you can also assume that artificial intelligence and human beings will not be that that far from each other. They will be all in intermixed with each other. You will have, in a way, what what I call swarm intelligence. So, so backfeed protocol is basically a sw is, it's a machinery for swarm intelligence of people, but it's also as just as much a machinery for swarm intelligence of of bots. Of bots or algorithms or artificial intelligence agents, so eventually you'll have these I don't know trillions of, of artificial agents, uh, artificial intelligence agents, uh, whether it's in I or Internet of Things or whether it's like in the financial market or anywhere, uh, each of which will operate by its own strategy, uh, and then you'll have millions and billions of people, each of which will be a free agent, you know, to to act in any way and be part of anything that he or she wants. And then the idea of the blockchain and, and, and the backfeed layer and all that is basically to indirectly synchronize, indirectly coordinate with all of those trillions of agents into a collective coherent state, in the collective coherent action. Um, the, the derivative will be that, that there will be a large-scale uh, correlations, large-scale corporations uh, that will make will make a, 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 will make much more efficient activity 
much more efficient decision making, uh, much more freedom. It, you can, I think this kind of movement will completely release the power uh, from the hands of a of, 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 uh, few people, uh, from the hands of, if you want, governments, from the hands of, of you know, uh, people with very, very large stake, um, and will be distributed in a much more uh, wide scale, I would say, not, ne not necessarily evenly, but in a, w in a wider scale. Um, it will uh, release uh, content, information, um, it will, will release, uh, it, it will create a uh, much uh, more co cooperative uh, environment. If you want, if you want, it's, it's creating the environment where cooperation is the winning strategy rather than competition, or, or better say, cooperation. So there is a lot of cooperation and maybe on things we agree and, co and competition on things we disagree. Uh, I think it can create. I think it's. I think today it's the only thing that actually can can uh, can uh, re, um, uh, can 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 cure if you want the ecology. So we talked before about decentralized governance. You can also apply all these ideas to a decentralized ecological governance. So the decision making of what is good uh, ecologically wise and what is bad ecological wise, and how to monetize that, and in a way incentivize large bodies to be ecologically viable um, it, it, it will create a much more coherent production uh, uh, chain because today the production chain is, is completely disrupted and divided into tiny 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 bits that each of which optimizes itself but the whole chain is completely off optimum the whole chain is completely disrupting the environment and completely disrupting the will and the desire of the cons consumers and when, when you have a, a, a spontaneously indirect uh, coordination over the whole throughout the chain you can optimize the, the, the whole chain to be you know ecologically wise and, and consumer wise and, 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 and everything so I, I would say that generally we will have a much more coherent world much less disrupted or, 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 or I don't know corrupted world I hope yeah no, that's uh, certainly a hope that we share as well so you mentioned a little bit about the, the GitHub plugin you're working on and also the, the publishing site. Is there anything else people should check out or you know, if they want to collaborate or cooperate with, with Backfeed, what's, what's the way to do it? Yeah, so, so firstly, the best way is to just enter our new website that we just launched recently, uh, backfeed.cc. Uh, B A C K F, -F W E D dot C C. Um, inside there, you can also reach the the Backfeed magazine that we just launched. Uh, this will be an open magazine where people will will uh, guest guest authors. I mean, we will also um, uh, fuel that. But guest authors will. We already have a list of get guest authors to write uh, blog posts and articles. And gradually, we will make that as, as our, one of our flagship applications. So the Backfeed magazine itself will be a decentralized collaboration. Uh, eventually, it will be fully decentralized, decentralized for the community and by the community. Um, of course, people are, are always welcome to be in touch with us, to cooperate. We will gradually build the decentralized collaboration around this. So we call it the DCO for DCOs. So to found a decentralized collaborative organization that is building the environment for decentralized collaborative organizations. Uh, and at some point, we'll also make a crowd sale of tokens to found, initiate that uh, DCO. So we expect the crowd sale of tokens for that towards the end of this year. Um, yeah, and, and, and I mean, people are contacting all the time and, 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 and we hope to create a movement, to create a momentum around that. Eventually, it's not only about us, by the way, it's, it's the stack that we are envisioning is a much bigger stack than just Backfeed. But we, we are... We, we are, if you want, uh, uh, um, making significant layers in the stack, but there are others. There are the blockchain uh, elements, there is the DHT elements, uh, and like uh, visual browser or, or explorer elements. And we are in touch with all of those groups who are building today components which may uh, serve as part in that stack. And we are trying to build up a, a much larger cooperation uh, to fuel and bring about the, the future that we see, so I think yeah, I think I think cooperation should be part of that of the design, also to make that that happen. Okay, well, Matan, thanks so much for coming on and and sharing a bit about what's going on with Backfeed and your vision for that, and I'm certainly looking forward to seeing what 
you know, as you roll those projects out and as those things kind of come into real life, how, how they turn out. So thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah, so we're at the end of our episode. So Epicent of Bitcoin is part of the LTB network. So you can, you can find lots of shows on Let's Talk Bitcoin and they're quite excellent. Uh, so please check that out on Let's Talk Bitcoin.com. And of course, our podcast, you can get, you know, get with all the familiar podcast apps and you can also watch videos on YouTube.com slash Epicent of Bitcoin. And uh, if you want to leave us a review, you can do so and we will send you one of those t-shirts. You should just need to let us know by sending us an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com and we'll send you a t-shirt. You can say it was the absolute best thing you've ever done with your life or you can say you're very angry at us for putting out such terrible content. Anything goes, but in any case, we will send you a t-shirt. So that's that and thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.